Welcome back. We are going to continue from where we stopped. We, the last session was on figures of speech. And this time around, we're going to look at idiomatic expressions, still under section A of the exams. Now, what is required of you here? Of course, you'll be tested on some of the areas that requires, you know, some of the areas that require interpreting idiomatic expressions. Some of them will be picked from, you know, everyday usage. Of course, a sentence will be given to you which contains the, the idiomatic expression, the, 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 the idiom, and then you will be required to pick the correct interpretation of such idiom. So we have some of the idiomatic expressions that sometimes come up. You can't really predict, but then if you study your past questions, then you should be able to predict, you know, the words that come up regularly. And of course, the idioms that are used for jam, they are standard British idioms. So you look out for the standard British idioms. We're not talking about, um, you know, I mean, other colloquial expressions. We are specific about idioms. So we're going to look at some of them here. For instance, a uh, bed of roses. So when you say a bed of roses, it's an idiomatic expression that means, you know, something that is easy or a situation that is not difficult. It's so easy. Do you understand? Sometimes people say life is not a bed of roses to mean that life the situation that one encounters in life is not easy, or some of the situations that one come across in the journey of life, you know, may not be easy. Another one is couch potato. A couch potato means a lazy person. You also have another one, spill the beans, which has to do with to reveal a secret pull oneself together. I think a lot of Nigerians, you know, don't use the idiom, use this idiom correctly. They, they say to put yourself together. But the correct and standard British idiom is pull oneself together, which means to control yourself in times of maybe trouble, to control, have control over your emotions. Other set of idioms that I want us to look at here, we can look at all of them, but there are just few words that you should have an understanding on. But I will urge you to study the past questions so that you will identify a lot of them there and then try to check their meanings in the dictionary so that you have a lot of them before you go in for the exams. To cross the Rubicon, that is to take an important decision in your life that cannot be reversed, an irrevocable decision that one has taken. When that happens, they crossed the Rubicon. Now, another one is behind closed doors, which has to do with taking, you know, what takes place, you know, secretly. It could be a meeting. They had uh, an executive meeting behind closed doors. A stone's throw. Stone's throw means you know a short distance. So all these words they can come up anytime. So having looked at idioms, I want us to also understand that in the same section A, you will be tested in some of these areas. How to identify main ideas using topic sentences. You also be tested. Some questions will come that will test your ability to identify supporting details and to differentiate supporting details from, you know, main ideas. And also, you'll be tested in this area as well, the area that is called um, implicit and explicit information, the information that is clearly stated in the passage and the information that is not clearly stated in the passage, you will be tested in all those areas. You have some questions that will test your understanding of what the writer has clearly said. Facts. 
and then some questions will come up that you will be required to make use of what the writer has clearly you know said in order to arrive at what he did not say clearly so all these areas we all these areas of understanding will be tested under what we can call comprehension and summary which is section a of the exams now let's move on to another section of the exams which is section b lexis and structure like i said earlier on this particular section will test your everyday understanding of language patterns linguistic patterns for instance let's look at some of the areas that you know your understanding of lexis and structure will be tested on for instance you'll be tested on synonyms like we said earlier on in our introduction synonyms are words that have you know almost same meaning but you don't have perfect synonyms in english and that is why some words they can replace each other in some context but they may not be able to replace uh, each other in other contexts do you understand you also be tested in the area of antonyms antonyms are opposite in meaning of course you also have homonyms and all these areas you will be tested and you have to have a full understanding of them we're going to look at them in detail in the, uh, as we move on you also be tested in some of the areas that have to do with clauses and sentence patterns and also word classes and their functions all these areas you have some questions come from them you also have some questions that will test your understanding of mood tense aspect number concord or agreement you know degrees of adjectives and question tags all these ones you will have some questions come from them you you also have some questions that will test your understanding of punctuations and spellings under lexis structure the same lexis structure your understanding of ordinary use of language figurative expressions and idiomatic expressions will be tested so you don't take anything for granted you do as much as possible to you know show your understanding of those areas by answering the questions that we provided on them so let's look at some of the essential things essential topics that you should have at the back of your mind while preparing for jan when it comes to section b lexis and structure so let's start with antonyms of course we said earlier on that antonyms they have to do with opposite in meaning and let's look at these words number one accidental the opposite of accidental is intentional do you understand you have accurate the opposite of accurate can be incorrect so you have a lot of words like that and words relate with one another in this relationship of oppositeness another thing that i want us to look at is synonyms you normally have about 10 questions coming from uh, your coming from synonyms you know they will test your understanding of synonyms you know using about 10 questions and of course synonyms have to do with sameness in meaning so let's take some examples here for instance you have magnificent the opposite the, the 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 another word that can replace it in some context will be wonderful fantastic splendid and you have other words like this in in english that you know work together in this regard and all of that so you have to really really read a lot about this because you have a whole lot of questions to answer on this so apart from synonyms i want us to look at mood mood is 
a very difficult thing in English. As far as English is concerned, mood can be very, very, you know, tricky. And then a lot of students struggle with it. You know, when you're talking about mood, you're talking about, you know, a verb situation. Mood occurs at the level of verbs. And in this regard, a mood of a verb can be, you know, it talks about, indicates whether what the writer is talking about is a fact or, or not. That's what mood is. Mood captures is that aspect of the verb that indicates whether the writer is giving a command, whether the writer is giving a statement, whether the writer is issuing out a fact, whether the writer is asking a question, or the writer is giving, just making a plain statement. So mood is that form of a verb that helps writers, speakers, you know, do things with language. For instance, it helps them to give command, it helps them to give a request. You know, mood helps writers to express opinion, maybe conditional statements and all of that. So there are three types of mood. You have imperative mood, you have indicative mood, and you have subjunctive mood. We are going to look at some of them so that you will have an understanding. The reason why it is picked for our discussion here is because um, a lot of students find it difficult to work with mood. So let's see how it is going to work. Now we're starting with the indicative mood. Indicative mood is used when we want to express a factual statement or maybe ask a question. For instance, English is Oh, sorry, England is in the UK. It's just a plain factual statement. England is in the UK. Now, we have a question. Where is Africa? Uh, especially in geography. When they ask where is Africa, they're talking about where is Africa located on the world map. So, all these ones. When you want to ask a question, when you want to express a habitual uh, occurrence, or when you want to express a fact, you're going to make use of indicative mood. Now, another one is the imperative mood. It's a mood that we, we use when we want to issue out command, you understand, or to make a polite request. For instance, you have remain standing, probably a teacher addressing a particular student. Remain standing, that's a command, so to say. Then, or maybe someone wants to, to make um, an offer. You may sit. It's an offer. Another example is, please lend me some money. That's a polite request. You can either add, please, or you can simply say it, lend me some money. You understand? Or you can say, could you lend me some money? When you want to sound really, really polite in some ways. So we make use of imperative mood to say some of these things or to do some of these things with language. The last word that I want us to understand is the subjunctive mood. This is the most complicated you know, type of mood that you need to be careful with. A lot of people mix it up. We make use of subjunctive when we want to express possibility, when we want to talk about hypothetical statement, or we want to express a wish. You understand? It could be real or an unreal condition. You can also make use of this kind of mood to express it. And another thing with this kind of mood is that it does not respect, you know, the rules of concord sometimes. Sometimes it does not even respect the principles of tenses. So let's have some examples. If I were you, I would have slept at home tonight. You understand? It's a conditional statement. It's an unreal condition because the writer cannot 
be the listener. That's why he says, if I were you, I would have slept at home tonight. Another example is, I insist she submit the result. Now notice the underlying part of the verbs in this regard, here and here. You notice that ordinarily, she should go with the simple present. She submits. She submits. But since you are using the subjunctive mood, or any time you are using the subjunctive mood, the issue of concord is sometimes neglected with certain verbs. Do you understand? That's why you have these examples. If I were you, instead of if I was you, well, in some informal context, sometimes you hear people say, if I was you, even amongst native speakers. But the standard subjunctive expression should be, if I were you, I would have slept at home tonight. I insist she submit the result. Another topic that I want us to look at, which we surely, you will surely encounter in your use of English uh, job is concord. Sometimes we refer to it as agreement. That is the correspondence between the subject of a sentence and the verb of that sentence. It can also be the correspondence between the subject of a verb and a sentence in terms of number and gender. You understand? So let's take some examples here, which means that, but before we look at examples, what we are trying to say here is that the agreement between the subject and the verb of a sentence here has to do with if the subject is singular, then the verb should be singular as well. That is in terms of number. And then if the, the gender, probably uh, it's a feminine gender, then it has to also go that way. For instance, if the antecedent of a pronoun is feminine, then the pronoun itself should also be feminine. All these are some of the issues that, you know, Concord deals with. I want us to, look, to understand that we have three types of Concords. Number one, you have grammatical Concord. You have notional Concord. And you have proximity Concord. And I want us to start with grammatical Concord. This is the most common Concord that anyone can talk of once the question of Concord comes up. Grammatical Concord has to do with how the verb and the subject agree in terms of number. For instance, if you have a singular subject, you should also have a singular verb. Now let's look at this example. The boy is kind. The boy is the subject, and boy is singular. So is is the verb, and is is singular. Now another example. The boys are kind. The boys plural subject, and are plural subject, I mean plural verb. So you, you notice the correspondence, boys and are, not boys and is. So it is important for us to understand how language operates at this level. So the boys are kind. You can also have two subjects. So if two subjects are combined with a coordinator like and, then the verb has to be plural. For instance, John and Mary are kind. But if you have two subjects, maybe two separate subjects, singular subjects, combined with maybe a subordinator, like as well as, then the verb has to be singular. For instance, if you say John as well as Mary, you're going to say is kind. John as well as Mary is kind. So this time around, John is the focus, as well as Mary is just a subordination, and you go with the first. So John as well as Mary is kind. You can also have a sentence like the president together with his ministers will be coming soon. Or the president together with his ministers um, is around 
So you are going to use is. You don't say are around. You don't say the president together with his ministers are around. You're going to say the president together with his ministers is around. Because together with his ministers, you know, is sub, I mean, subordinated to the subject, which is the president. So that's how, you know, concord work or concord works at this level. So another type of concord is notional concord. For instance, this has to do with maybe collective nouns. Sometimes, you know, we use collective nouns in singular forms, and then sometimes we use them, you know, in plural forms. For instance, the class perform well. In this regard, you know, you have the collective noun, the class, taken as a plural subject, and that's why you have perform well. So when action, activity is involved, you're going to use the collective noun as a plural. But where action is not involved, you're going to use it as a singular. And that's why you have the class is quiet. You don't say the class are quiet. It would be wrong because there is no activity involved, involved in this regard. Therefore, the, the collective noun, the class, should take singular subject. So finally, I want us to look at proximity concord under the use of concord. And in proximity concord, you are looking at the subject that is closer to the verb. If you have two subjects in a sentence, and one of the subject is singular, and the other is plural, then your verb is going to be determined, your choice of verb whether singular or plural is going to be determined by the subject that is closer to it. For instance, neither the doctor, doctor is a subject, nor the nurses are to blame. So in this case, you have two subjects, you have doctor, you also have nurses. So since they are together, and then in the sentence structure, nurses is closer to the verb are. So it would be wrong to say neither the doctor nor the nurses is to blame because the closer subject, nurses, here is a plural form, therefore the verb has to be plural. And that's why this is correct. It is correct to say that neither the doctor nor the nurses are to blame. Now look at the other example here where you have the whole thing changed. Read it yourself, it says neither the nurses nor the doctor is to come, I mean, sorry, is to blame. Now, in this case, nurses is plural, doctor is singular, but doctor is closer to the verb. That is why you have the verb is here. So we call it proximity concord. It has to do with the particular uh, subject that is closer to the verb should agree with the verb when you have two subjects, one singular and the other plural. So now that we have talked about um, concord, I think we have done a lot of things regarding section B, which is um, lexis and structure. So let's move on to section C now. Now in section C, you will be tested in this area oral forms, the spoken form of English. So let's see what is required. Now these are the key areas that your questions will come from. For instance, question, questions will come from monothons, others will come from diphthongs. You also, you're also going to have some questions come from consonants and consonant clusters. You will have some questions come from rhymes and homophones. And then you will have some questions come from word stress and emphatic stress. So we're going to explain them as we make progress. But before then, I want us to have a general look at all of them. Now when you are talking about monotons, like I said earlier on, English sound system is, you know, is in such a way that you have 44 sounds. 
Now, if we're talking about consonants, they are just 24. They, they are just grouped according to place of articulation and manner of articulation. Pardon me for mixing up at that point. Consonants are 24 and they are grouped according to place of articulation and manner of articulation. Now, on that place of articulation and manner of articulation, you have some of them um, affricates, you have fricatives, you have um, lateral, you have proximal, and all of them. Then, you also have uh, consonant clusters. Consonant clusters occur when two or more consonants you know, appear at the same time in the same place without an intervening vowel, without a vowel coming in between them. When that happens, you have what is called consonant clusters. And of course, rhymes. Rhymes have to do with what is called um, sameness, especially at the end, sameness of sounds at the, at the end of, the, of words. For instance, you can have two words, and then at the end of the, of the two words, you're going to have maybe the last syllable of each word we rhyme, we sound the same. When that happens, you have what is called rhymes. And then homophones are words that are sometimes maybe spelled differently, but then they have the same pronunciation. So the exams will test you in these areas as well. And of course, when you are talking about word stress, you're talking about, you know, of course you have two types of stress. You have the primary stress and the secondary stress. At the level of uh, monosyllabic words, stress is not even an issue because stress is automatic. But then, whenever you have bisyllabic and polysyllabic, stress becomes an issue because in a situation whereby you have more than three syllables or three syllables in a word, as a second language user, you're wondering which syllable should receive the highest degree of prominence. You understand? Should receive the highest degree of prominence. And then at the sentence level two, you have that. So we are going to come back again. We'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll look into some of these things in detail.